Hello everyone. Welcome to this session. Today uh, we are talking about um, high performance congestion control HPCC++ uh, uh, mechanism and how it is enabled by uh, leveraging uh, IFA and we will also talk about a specific uh, deployment use case. I am Bhaskar Chinni, a product line manager at uh, Broadcom um, and uh, today we have uh, my colleague Surendra Anabolu. Uh, he is a distinguished engineer and then um, Rui um, from Alibaba, uh, who will explain uh, details about the deployment. So uh, Broadcom is innovating uh, specifically in the area of uh, telemetry uh, from uh, silicon to silicon, and this is our uh, one uh, key focus area. Uh, in addition to innovating in our silicon, we are also contributing uh, the specification and the features uh, to SAI community, and that is done through the uh, telemetry and monitoring um, uh, specification. Um, we have uh, Jay here, who is the architect of uh, TAM spec, so you can speak to him uh, uh, after the session if you have any questions. So this uh, TAM specification uh, is covering several telemetry features, like streaming telemetry, uh, mirror on drop, um, flow tracker, and in-band telemetry uh, is uh, one uh, key mechanism in it. So what is uh, in-band telemetry? So our implementation of in-band telemetry is called in-band flow analyzer, IFA. Uh, it is, you are familiar with the SNMP, uh, flow tracker, or, you know, S-flow, all those mechanisms. Those are all considered as out of band because the silicon maintains uh, certain counters, either through operating system or through other mechanism, you retrieve those counters periodically. In-band telemetry is about adding the packet processing metadata within the packet, within the user packet itself in the data plane, meaning the whole CPU is not impacted by this. And that enables a uh, scalability uh, at a packet level granularity without impacting the uh, host CPU. So the way it works, uh, when packet is traversing one from one hop to another hop, each hop adds its own metadata in a cumulative manner. So what is that metadata? Uh, it is like, oh, what is the switch ID? When did the packet arrive at the top? When did the packet leave? What port it arrived? What port it left? What is the queue ID? What is, was, the, uh, was the queue congested at that time? All those details are captured at the packet level, uh, added to the user packet itself, and then uh, um, uh, traversed in the network. So that means the last node will have an accumulation of the metadata sets from each hop the packet went through and it will um, send out a report to the collector. So there are several use cases. Uh, honestly, uh, you know, we are still uh, hearing more and more use cases uh, uh, on this uh, IFA. Um, like uh, you will uh, hear one uh, great example today that is related to congestion monitoring and rocky V2 network optimization. And the other use cases are uh, latency monitoring because uh, application latency monitoring is a very uh, important problem that uh, uh, network operators face on everyday basis. And uh, IFA uh, provides uh, unprecedented visibility in that area congestion monitoring, network performance anomaly detection. Actually, speaking of that, uh, we have another session on network performance anomaly detection jointly with Alibaba uh, this afternoon. So you may want to join to learn more about uh, the, that use case as well. And uh, this IFA is supported both live traffic and uh, probe traffic. Um, it is, we are uh, contributing to the uh, IETF, in addition to, of course, uh, contributing to the SAI. Uh, with that, um, I will hand over to my colleague, Surendra, who will explain uh, more details about this uh, Rocky V2 optimization use case. I want to take a couple of minutes uh, to talk about like where we are with the uh, Rocky V2 and condition control, and then um, Rui will go over the HPCC and how we could uh, solve some other problems and how it can be made better with the uh, IFA and uh, in-band network telemetry. So today, like in Rocky V2, uh, Rocky V2 is uh, lost, it is, uh, it's used widely in AI and many other places where lossless uh, network is needed. And it depends on two mechanisms. Uh, it depends on PFC, which was there for a long time, and also it depends on ECN, 
and ECN is supposed to be marking the, it, it, it will mark the packets when the condition is experienced, and PFC is more like a guardrail. You know, it's like if the sources are not responding fast enough, there's uh, the time scale differences, and the PFC kicks in, and usually the ECN uh, marking, when it gets back to the source, those CNPs, then the source will slow down, and then, uh, but these two things can work independently. Uh, uh, they can work independently in the sense that uh, ECN is used for the flow-based condition control and the PFC comes in when the time scales are large and the buffers get full. And PFC basically ensures that there are no packet drops anywhere. Uh, the DCQCN is one of the condition uh, uh, protocol, uh, notification protocols that uses the ECN markings to uh, make sure that the, you are realizing the last list network. Uh, that seems to work pretty okay, but uh, what we see in practice is that the buffers, like the, the sources tend to push a lot of traffic because they're not aware of what's happening on the, on the path. There's no information, there's no fine-tuned information available. Rui will go over. So basically, you, you saw this from Ram and Mark on the opening keynote uh, talking about how the existing mechanisms, you saw this slide, like which pushes a lot of packets into the buffer and then, uh, then that causes uh, overload, and which takes longer times to react. And then you move to the uh, mechanisms based on the in-network telemetry and end-to-end -end, end -end control, and the information, the additional information that is uh, available can be used for a precise condition notification, which will make this much, much more smoothly with smaller buffers and with much faster response times. And uh, I think the details of that is, uh, Pass to Rui to go over. Yeah. yeah. So uh, the continuous control actually is the key for the high speed networking uh, because typically application require high throughput uh, for those large transfers. Uh, in the meanwhile, there are small messages which de demand for low latency. And, uh, and also, application doesn't want to have this packet loss, and the packet loss uh, e even uh, trigger those PFC. Uh, PFC stone and the PFC deadlock. So that's caused network uh, stability issue. So um, we propose uh, um, HPCC, stand for High Precision Continuing Control, which is achieved uh, these three objects uh, simultaneously. So um, previously, uh, continuing control actually uh, supported by uh, uh, lots of uh, heuristic algorithms. So those algorithms are actually based on um, like a, a packet loss and uh, experience a, late, a long latency and also uh, ECN to uh, identify the congestion. So those heuristic uh, typically spend a long time to converge and, and also they rely on the detection of a congestion in the network, which means that the damage has already been taken. And uh, lastly, uh, because, uh, because we use lots of this heuristic algorithm, um, typically apply uh, lots of a parameter uh, to let it work. So that's a, for engineering, we spend lots of time to tune in this parameter so we work properly with our network. So when the when the coming with the uh, inbound telemetry uh, being deployed in our data center for monitoring and diagnosis purposes, we think why not use the inbound telemetry for congestion control as well? Uh, because once we have this inbound telemetry information, we can leverage it to precisely um, uh, detect what's the uh, link utilization in our network. So in this case, we don't have to rely on the heuristic algorithm to guess what's going on in our network, but also, but uh, instead, we can precisely understand what's the utilization in, in our network, so we can um, uh, grow, um, increase the, our bandwidth if there's a more uh, capacity in our, in our NIC, and also if there's a congestion, we can uh, reduce our sending rate. And in that, in addition, we can also um, uh, um, use all the capacity close to the link capacity, but, but not, not quite yet. We can close to, we can, so that's way we can achieve nearly 100% utilization, but also um, slightly uh, lower than 100%, so we have the bandwidth headroom. When there's a traffic burst happen, uh, we can use that bandwidth headroom to observe the traffic burst. So in this case, we can achieve both high throughput 
and also we can achieve close to zero uh, uh, network queuing to achieve low latency. So just to give you an example, uh, because we deployed the HVCC to uh, machine learning application and a storage application as well. So this example is showing that we deploy uh, to storage application. Um, in our cloud, we typically up, uh, apply for the compute and the storage disaggregation, um, or you can call it storage uh, uh, disaggregation as well. So um, in a typically cloud cluster uh, running thousands of servers, um, the, the computer traffic actually uh, just within the uh, computer cluster. And we have a separate uh, storage cluster which cons consists of uh, 100 uh, storage nodes. In this case, when the virtual machine wants to access their, uh, their storage, they typically will generate the storage I.O. and it all, all goes through all the way to the storage cluster. So in this, in this sense, even the storage access will go through a network. So the bandwidth and the latency is so important for this application. And based on our measurement study, we showed that the storage application uh, or storage traffic actually take on more than 60% of the total data center traffic. Um, but the storage traffic actually will be spread out through all the storage nodes because they want to have the very low latency. Uh, so that's why they can spread out the traffic to uh, achieve very high, high uh, parallelism uh, to achieve uh, both um, high throughput and low latency. As I mentioned about storage traffic takes on 60% of data center traffic. So uh, in this case, storage traffic is both binary hungry uh, and also latency very sensitive. Um, so to detect the congestion, what we do is that we allow the, the sender uh, in, in, in our case, is RDMA is a rocky, so allow the uh, RDMA NIC to send out the, the problem packets uh, for each round trip time. The problem packet actually will have the same five tuple with the, uh, the co pair of the real packet or data packets, so it will go through the same um, pass. Uh, the, 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 the problem packet will go through the switch along the pass, and each switch will assign the um, anti metadata uh, into the problem packets. So the metadata will tell um, the queue length, what's the queue length in this, uh, uh, this queue, and also the timestamp and the TX bytes. Uh, TX bytes means that um, how, many, uh, how, much byte, uh, how many bytes uh, has been sent from this queue until now. So if we do a, 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 a delta, we know that the, uh, the link utilization of this link so based on those information, um, when, the, when the problem packet arrive in the receiver, and the receiver can uh, generate the response packet back to the sender. So the sender, based on uh, those link utilization information, to calculate, um, to calculate if I need to increase the sending rate or if I need to reduce the sending rate because the network is congested. So um, we proposed the HPCC um, back in 2019. Uh, we published an uh, academia paper in CECOM um, uh, that year. Um, after uh, three years, we worked with Vendor to uh, uh, deliver this idea in, into the Vendor devices, including um, Broadcom chip uh, to uh, support INT in our, in our network. So right now, uh, in this year, we, we actually have deployed um, more than 100,000 servers, and uh, we are keep uh, pushing to more clusters. Um, based on our deployment, we support application running for machine learning, uh, storage, and database applications. And uh, based on our measurement study showing that uh, by deploying HPCC, um, our, the RDMA traffic performance actually um, uh, reduced the latent tail latency by 80% in the tail. And, and also, um, we mostly eliminate the buffer uh, or congestion triggered uh, packet loss. So it doesn't matter if you turn on PFC or turn on PFC because uh, mostly you don't have any packet loss. Um, and uh, um, in, in the future, we, we, we want to explore how we can leverage 
INT to, to do more stuff. Uh, for example, right now we, we use the INT to understand what's the utilization of this link, right? So if it's a link congested, we can slow down. Uh, but, uh, but if this link is, uh, or this path is uh, overloaded, why not we just switch to a different path? Maybe you can have a better bandwidth otherwhere. So we are looking for other um, opportunity where the end host can um, um, like, uh, uh, detect the, the, the link of the utilization among different passes to allow them to um, understand, to allow, allow them to migrate to different passes. So that's a, a different uh, requirement for, for, for our storage-based deployment because for the storage traffic, actually the, the traffic actually being spread out because uh, if you want to read and write a, a different storage block, you actually chunk it into different uh, small uh, stor storage chunks, chunks. So each chunk is very small. Um, so that, that the network actually is, is very balanced. But we will work on the machine learning application the, the, the workload actually is quite different. Uh, so in that application, because you want to do um, the all reduce and you want to uh, copy the different files from the storage, and we have we see that the, actually the load is imbalanced in our network. Uh, in that case, the congestion control is not good enough. So we we need to have a way to um, to use to leverage the the bandwidth across the network. It's not just a, a single pass. So that's a kind of extension we want to do uh, in the future uh, by also leveraging the inbound telemetry information. Um, to conclude, um, uh, we encourage us, uh, you to join our, our this, uh, this direction. We also have a, a IETF standard, um, uh, HPCC++. We talk about our protocol and how we work with, with different vendor to align uh, the, the, the protocol, the algorithm, and, and the format. Feel free to, uh, to join us. Th thanks, Rui. Um, that was a good description of uh, the um, IFAR deployment for HPCC++ use case there. Um, Basically, uh, as you saw from Broadcom's keynote and other presentations as well, um, for AI, ML workloads are very different, and there are a couple of mechanisms. People talked about perfect load balancing is one mechanism. Another mechanism is using in-band telemetry so that uh, you basically identify the congestion point and then uh, um, take action uh, from an end-to-end -end control point of view, right? So uh, this, uh, what, you, what you saw today is basically the second example in-band telemetry, how you can use. The beauty here is um, it works on your existing network, right? Uh, so you leverage the telemetry and then you optimize and bingo, you have a higher performance. With that, um, any questions? Yes. Uh, thanks for the talk. It's uh, really interesting. So one question I have is um, is that uh, when you send out the probing packet, every hop is going to add some metadata to the packet, right? So as you mentioned earlier. So what is the size of the metadata that each hop is adding, and what is the longest path you can support? Yeah, the size of the metadata, uh, there is a minimum set of the metadata that is uh, uh, de de uh, defined, and it can go up to 32 bytes of data. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there's 32 bytes, and then uh, the, uh, you can go to uh, up to uh, 64 bytes is the maximum. But 32 bytes is what, what, what's used. So in the HPCC, there's like, uh, if you look at the draft, there's an informational draft that we just published. There is uh, uh, three different ones. Uh, there's a P4 INT, there's a IOM, and then uh, there's a IFA uh, format. You'll see different lines there. Okay. So, so the deployed one is uh, 32 bytes. Yeah. 32 bytes. Okay, cool. Uh, so how fast can you respond to uh, congestions? Uh, you, you mentioned that uh, uh, use traditional ECN, uh, DCQCN, it takes longer time, and the damage has already been done. And when the time you realize there's a congestion, so how fast can you detect versus uh, uh, ECN, traditional ways? So uh, for ECN, traditional approaches, you can only know if you can cut to half or right, you can gross, uh, you, you could do additive increase step by step, 
right? So, but for, for INT, because you know precisely what's the utilization, if it's a 70% or 20% utilization, so you can directly jump to the uh, target utilization, which is the 95 percentage of 95 utilization. So um, in that case, we only uh, need one round trip time to directly jump to the target utilization uh, directly. I see, I see. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah, th think about right, like in the traditional ECN, you just get a one bit every time. So you can only do so much. So you, there's a rate at which you can go up, there's a rate at which you can you have to come down, and you need to recover whenever the link speed is available. With um, much more richer INT, you can jump to whatever the link band is available right away in one round of time. I see. But this also requires that every single server in the network participate in this schema. If the, you have a bad citizen, then everything falls apart in a certain way? No? Um, part of, yeah. We, so, because uh, um, we, we, we deploy in RDMA, so every server will talk to the same language, right? But uh, uh, in the switch, if, if a part of the switch um, support INT, but the, the rest of them doesn't support, for those kind of a switch, we'll fall back to the uh, traditional continuum control mechanism like ECN or loss or, or latency stuff. So, uh, so but it, w w if your congestion happens in those switches, you, you will fall back to the performance of uh, ECN. I see. So because but if you more space for the good citizens, so good citizens can come in and take more. Yeah. So oh, I see. I see. Okay. The, the ex experience for us is that congestion mostly happen in the in the leaf switch, yeah. in the last hop. Yeah. Um, so we we we'll, we'll make sure that the last the leaf switch will also put INT so that we can cover maybe ninety percent of the congestion happen there, but for the rest of them, um, it, if it doesn't support, it will fall back to use the ECN. So that's uh, our philosophy. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. Very Thank you. Great questions. I also have a question about the, the probe packets. So these probe packets are not data packets, but they're explicit just probe packets. Does that mean that it adds more overhead because there's more traffic in the network? Have you uh, explored tagging or putting this uh, INT in the data packets? Would that provide more timely, uh, a more timely congestion signal than having separate probe packets and probing intervals? Um, yeah. So the timing is not an issue because we send the probing packet uh, only if we have a data packet to send. So it's uh, actually synchronized or back to back with the data packet. If there's no data packet, we don't have to send the probing packet, and because the probing packet is a per copy, right? So. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the overhead, we also think about that because uh, uh, problem pack is very small. That's, that's the first thing. And, and the, also second, we only send the problem packet if there's a data packet to send. So uh, for example, this round, the first round trip time, we have a, we have a problem packet, data packet to send. And then if the second round trip time, you, have, you don't have a data packet, then we don't have to send the problem packet. Well, it's well, a c oh. well, why don't you put the telemetry in the, in the data packet? Since you're both sending them both at the same time, um, yeah, there are there are a couple of consideration. First is the it's about the privacy or security. If there's a bug in the in the telemetry, then we actually drop the customer packet. That's a very uh, uh, dangerous for, for for the cloud provider. And and also uh, adding the inbound to the data packet actually gets an extra uh, uh, consideration on the MTU you actually increase the MTU of, of a standard packet, and if the larger than the MTU network can support, you will cause a packet drop as well. Yeah, I also want to add that in practice, you'll see it's far less than 1%, where you can confirm that, is because of the two factors. One is, it is sent every round trip time, and second is, it's a small packet, right? Like as you heard previously, the average packet size is pretty large, so a so combination of these two makes it very, very small, tiny, tiny fraction, a sliver of the network traffic. Can you share the interval used between the sender and receiver? The interval uh, in number. You mentioned the regular interval between sender and receiver. I wonder wha how frequent it is done. Oh, we send the problem packet once in per round trip time. So it really depends on the round trip time mm -hmm. of the network. If there's only 
one co pairs, the run trip time could be 10 microseconds. But uh, if you have uh, like a thousand or 10,000 concurrent co pairs, and each one will get a, uh, uh, you need to get a window to send a packet. In this case, you probably wait for a long time to, to send the problem packet until the, the data packet get out, right? Can you comment on the stability of the system? Do you end up synchronizing across the servers in terms of bursting traffic and, and having oscillation in the, in the bandwidth that you're achieving, if I understood you correctly? You mean stability in terms of... Uh, from, from the point of view, it seems like you're sending the probe, you're getting an idea of the network congestion state. Based on that, you're setting the sending rate on a given server that's sending the probe. Okay. Correct? But you're having multiple servers sending traffic at the same time. Okay. Both of them, are, all of them are probably probing the network, getting a state of the congestion. Independently, they are ramping up the traffic, maybe causing congestion. And then they measure, then they step back. So you get into this oscillation probably about bursting and then yeah, backing yeah. off and so forth, right? Yeah, this yeah. This distributed control. So how do you deal with that? Yeah, so there's a, uh, the category of a primary congestion control and a dual mode congestion control. So that's happened for the dual mode continuum control where switch decide the sending rate for all the host. That's caused the oscillation because the switch is a single point and, and if they have a different um, like a fluctuation, they will cause a loss of a flat, uh, back and forth, right? But the HPCC, although they leverage the switch information, but it's a sender base, it's a primary mode continuum control algorithm. And each sender, um, may have a different time to, to understand the congestion status. And each sender send the problem packet at randomly at different time. So if this sender increase and this sender may have a different time to, to increase. So it's actually uh, randomized and spread out in, uh, in, in this round trip time period. So uh, in our theory or uh, our analysis, we found that primary mode congestion control actually uh, perform better in terms of stability than, than dual mode congestion control. We, we, that's what we use. So the dual mode is referred to as doing what exactly? That Sorry? What, what is the dual mode? Uh, can you define that? Oh, dual mode congestion control is allow the switch to decide the sending rate for, for, for the traffic, like RCP. I see. Yeah, so we, 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 we investigate a little bit on the dual mode congestion control, and uh, we found that it's, it's a, it's a longer time to, to, uh, to, to be stable. Uh, we, don't, we cannot give precise information. We can only give a, a rough estimation. We, we, or we need a very long time to, to run estimation. All right, so quick question. I'll follow up on that. But the other thing that could you be caught in, uh, in micro situation on the switches, do you have like any multi-interval measurement or you do it based, you set the rate based on a single measurement? For example, you may be sending the probe you could be hitting a momentary kind of congestion because of microburst of other traffic happening on these links, and you're reacting to that. Are you are you trying to do that, like the setting the rate of the sender based on a single measurement that you're sending, or you, you're kind of con and adjusting the, the the sending rate, or you, you're doing based on multiple intervals? We only do the based on the one probably based on the sender point of view, and we do this uh, based on once round trip time, once per round trip time. We cannot do more than one trip time that will cause the stability issue. At least uh, the sender do, uh, uh, at least change the sending rate once per round trip time. That could be, that, that's, we can prove that it can be stable. Okay, thank you. I know we're kind of wrapping up. Thank you. Uh, I think we can take questions offline, but uh, we are, we'll break for lunch and we'll be back at uh, 12.30. Thank you. Uh,